everyone, I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this first Friday of the month, April the 5th. This week, Coloradans in 80 cities and towns voted in municipal elections on leadership positions, ballot measures, things like taxes, the makeup of town councils, charters, it, everything that makes local communities their own. But there are many other statewide issues still in the balance with more elections to come this year and our legislature in session for just about another four and a half weeks. Let me introduce you to our panel this week. We have Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Eric Sonderman, columnist for Colorado Politics and the Colorado Springs and Denver Gazettes. Also, Chris Rourke, consultant with Rourke Media, and Laura Eldrete, a city building consultant and regional director at Hatch Urban Solutions and former executive director of community planning and development for the city and county of Denver. Thank you all for coming this week. Let's start with all the activity with the congressional races, especially, uh, Patty, in CD4. It's been a busy week. Right, right as we were filming this, things were just going kablooey in District 4. So you have the Republicans making the interesting choice of not anointing, say, Jerry Sonnenberg, one of the, certainly one of the front runners in the November race, but he was not made, he did not make it to be the interim candidate because they have to replace Ken Buck before the November election. So on June 25th, the District 4 is going to be voting not just in the primary, but also for the interim person. And they chose Greg Lopez. Just when you think the Colorado Republican Party couldn't get any wackier, we have Greg Lopez, definitely a controversial candidate who's going to be a placeholder, but I doubt a silent placeholder in that race. So we have that. The Democrats did decide to pick one of the people who was already in the race for, in November, Tris Calvarese, who seems like a really interesting candidate. Democrats are very outnumbered in that district, but who knows? She could surprise people because they might not want to get into the clown car of Republican candidates right now. You've Lauren Boebert, who had her emergency surgery. It is just the wildest congressional district out of several that are going to be wild this November. Clown car is a good description, but I would say it applies on both sides of the aisle. I don't know that Tricia Calvarese is a clown, but she is not the kind of candidate who's ever going to be competitive or win that kind of a congressional district. She comes out of a labor background. She's campaigning on Medicare for all, uh, obviously abortion rights, climate policies, et cetera. That's all well and good if you're running in Denver, if you're running in Boulder, maybe even if you're running in a few precincts on the Western Slope. It's not going to sell in, you know, Eastern Weld County, Eastern Adams County, Douglas County, and that whole wide swath of the Eastern Plains. That is just, you know, we can sit here and criticize, and Lord knows it's easy pickings, the Republican Party in Colorado, but the Democratic Party sometimes, and we've seen it at the Capitol as well, tilts mighty far left, and I think this is an example of that. I think um, Eric raises some good points about these Democratic candidates that have been, you know, appointed to this special election. Also, John Padora is also running in uh, the primary. We have Ike McCorkle. None of these Democratic candidates give a disgruntled Republican reason to vote for them. They are very traditional Democrat candidates. And so there is the possibility, however, because we saw the polling. Now, a poll came out recently that put Ike McCorkle above Lauren Boebert. If Lauren Boebert is the um, primary winner and becomes the candidate to run in that race, it does raise the question, could that district be vulnerable to a Democrat winning? Not because the Democrat candidates are so compelling, but perhaps like we saw in CD3 last election around, there was quite a bit of protest votes. I think we need to think about the voters in this district. And I think it will be tremendously confusing to have two votes, uh, two elections happening on a single day. And to, the, to Patty's earlier comment about the clown car, I, I was thinking about it in terms of a roller coaster, but I think we will see a roller coaster for the next several months of whether it's the polls or the commentary, the debates happening, uh, which will add to that level of confusion. Unfortunately, I think given the trends that we have at the national level, those um, people, I worry that people will continue to vote by the party and not by the issues. And sometimes that lay, leads people to vote uh, 
in contrast to their lived experiences, uh, which doesn't bode well for the district at the end of the day. And so uh, I, I'm hoping that most of the Coloradans who are in the middle, I believe, will actually vote their, based on their, that experience and their needs and not by party line. Okay. All right. This week, members of the Denver City Council admitted that they have no idea how much Mayor Mike Johnson's House 1000 program is costing the city. A meeting on Wednesday was supposed to clear some things up, but I think only led to more questions. For example, $10 million, Eric, is what the city said has been spent on homeless, but the council has already allocated over $100 million. And it just a lot of questions remain as to what is going and if it's an effective program. Oh, what small minds here wanting information on whether it's 10 million or 100 million or 110 million? Oh, come on, it's all within a margin of error. Obviously, I'm being facetious. The city doesn't have answers for these basic questions, and it should not be that opaque. Uh, there should be more transparency. And then you have the added piece of that the city does not even count death if someone has been housed. Uh, in a temporary shelter is now back on the streets uh, and that death is not regarded as a negative outcome. The quote from a city spokesperson was as follows, it was shocking, quote, we and our partners don't count deceased as a negative outcome. I mean, uh, I think most other people might regard death uh, as somewhat different uh, in their consideration. Chris. Well, thoughts? back in December when there was this mad rush to house 1,000 people and make this deadline, one of the things we talked about at this table was that a lack of transparency in this program would lead to its failure. And I think it's inexcusable that the funding is so messy. There should be an accounting, it's taxpayer money, there should be an accounting of how this money's being spent. And Mike Johnston, knowing that this has come forward as an issue, should take the lead, call a news conference, and give us an accounting of what's been spent and what is going to be spent going forward. Additionally, is this program going to attract more of the unhoused? I, I understand that there is an encampment at 8th and Navajo, uh, a traditional site where um, the unsheltered go, but it's growing by the day. I think it's about 300 people now. And then the safety issues have to be addressed. And yeah, the city is saying that a vast majority of the people who have been in micro communities or hotels, many of them are back on the streets. Yes. You've worked with the city, you've worked with housing. We all understand it's a difficult and t tough issue. I will say, as a downtown worker, the streets are cleaner the streets feel safer than they have in the past two years. So I do want to acknowledge the Johnson administration for changing the feel of our streets. Now, whether how long it's going to be successful is another question. Um, you know, separately, I think also that 100% the administration should have had a KPI around funding sources and uses. Right, that's just a starting point for any kind of a project. The may this project to move at a thousand, a thousand people um, off of the streets in a six month period does not, is not the pace at which government works, right? So I, so I also see the challenge that he has pushed the system into by moving so fast to put a thousand people, bring a thousand people off the streets. But lastly, I don't want to um, uh, lose sight of the rest of the spectrum of affordable housing, right? Families who are working, who have kids in school, who are doing all the right things, but their rent keeps increasing and they are getting closer and closer to the verge of becoming homeless. And a little bit of investment there could go so much further uh, than, um, than other instances. And just in general, we need to keep our eyes on all of, all of our residents, not just the homeless. You know, we have an independently elected auditor, Tim O'Brien, who won an award last year for his audit of the city's encampment policy. And he should be on it right now. He's planning on doing an audit in 2024 of homeless, the homelessness provider, um, host, and the different services. But he should be on that now. I mean, we need an independent look. Obviously, the mayor's office should be providing this, but if they can't get it straight, and a lot of things they've done, like we've seen the money that's gone into buying hotels or motels, which then might have eight people die in them, which I think is the double tree issue. Eight people, three shot, five vague, but probably not negative. 
Eric. Uh, they just are dead. Um, and so they really need to do an audit of where the money's going, where the money is going to be going in the future. And I would argue they probably have to figure out who's where and who did pass away and why. Also this week, a calf was killed by a wolf in Grand County. That is where 10 wolves were released this winter by Colorado Parks and Wildlife following the statewide vote that was in favor of reintroducing wolves to Colorado, Chris. Now the facts are lining up with what people thought would, would happen. Um, opponents were highly criticized by those who put forward this, this ballot initiative. Um, they were told that they were overreacting and that depredation is part of, you know, the adjustment that will have to be made. And now we are seeing the true reality four months after these wolves have been re or introduced into Colorado. We're going to see shortly if Colorado has learned from this situation because there's another ballot initiative that is circulating for signatures right now. It's Initiative 91 and it would essentially ban wildcat or mountain lion bobcat hunting in Colorado. It's what people have called ballot box biology, another measure like the wolf situation. Um, opponents say that this will categorically change how hunting is done. CPW came out with a fact sheet in January, a, a two-page fact sheet, which I highly recommend people look up and become educated about how CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, manages wildlife. They are the experts. This is an opportunity. We'll see if um, voters will allow the wildlife managers, the experts in the case, to continue to manage wildlife like they know is best or if the voter thinks they know better. Okay. Laura, your thoughts? Chris, I'm, I'm going down the same line as you are. I, I think the challenge here is that this requires technical expertise mm -hmm. uh, that the voters should never have been asked, and including myself. So the problem here is the citizen initiative um, process that we have and not using our government as it's been established to rely on systems um, on Colorado um, Wildlife Department to make those decisions based on you know, experts and data that they have. And I think the question I would ask uh, in general is, you know, how do we as a collective state, which has a variety of different types of, of folks and economies, um, how do we support our economy? How do we celebrate our history and our various ways of lives? Uh, in a way that is responsive to the issues that we're facing in the 21st century. We are not back in 1888 anymore. Uh, and, and I just don't believe at the end of the day that these two supposed opposing sides are actually mutually exclusive. Is there a path forward where we could think about ranching that is more sustainable? And I think there are groups out there doing that already. Okay. Patty. Well, in this case, the wolves are out of the barn and let's hope that the rancher who lost the calf is compensated fairly. There's been a lot of discussion on the whole compensation issue, whether or not you're supposed to be dealing with the wolves with non-lethal force. And ballot box bi biology is not over yet. We might be voting on wolverines too, uh, whether or not they should be coming back into the state. So everyone needs to take some biology classes and really study up before November. People need to get off their high horse particularly some of those who are most vociferous in support of the wolf reintroduction. And I've received comments to the effect of, well, it was just one calf, and there are 87 million more. That was one comment I received. Uh, there are other comments that denigrate the whole cattle industry and ranching as a profession in Colorado and that it's a declining significance in this state and it's a dying breed, pun not intended, uh, what have you. Uh, that does not speak well for people who mount those kinds of arguments. We can have legitimate disagreements, but ranching is an integral part of this state. It is not going around, excuse me, not going away anytime soon. Ranchers work very hard and they do not deserve that kind of disrespect that has been evidenced. I don't want to paint the brush too broadly, but it's been evidenced in some quarters. A top industry in our state. We just can't overlook it, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. All right, at the legislature, the budget is still being decided upon for next year. And again, one of the big priorities is helping Coloradans afford to live here. Aspect, aspect strategic 
released some findings from a poll this week that says four out of ten Coloradans have considered moving to a different state because of our cost of living. Mm -hmm. Laura, our leaders are very pressed to figure this out. Right, and, and as of last count, I think there were five land use, housing related bills uh, moving in various stages of the process, parking requirements, uh, accessory dwelling units, transit oriented communities, strategic growth, and then lastly, occupancy limits. From a perspective of building resilient, more equitable, financially sustainable communities, I think all five of these need to pass. Uh, in areas such as the metropolitan region, we will be stronger together, and the only way that's gonna happen is if those bills pass at the state level. Now, I know I've just upset a lot of people um, because of, um, of local uh, law and local um, powers, but sometimes in order to move forward as a community, I think we need to move forward as a whole and not uh, um, disparately. Well, when you add in the people who've wanted to move not out of state, but to cheaper parts of the state, you're at 50% in that poll, which is really interesting and also gets you to this local issue, which is the reason the proposal last year, the affordable housing whole package, went down so badly was because local municip municipalities didn't feel they had a say. They thought they were lumped in with the expensive front range areas. And we're seeing that again still, that people are going to be really concerned. They are leaving the more expensive parts of the state on purpose, and in many cases, just going to other parts of the state. And they're going to want to take control of their own destiny rather than have it decided at the legislature. So we still have a big mess to solve. At least some of the rental help is coming through now. The eviction help, the rental help, so immediate help is at hand. Mm -hmm. Eric. Uh, first off, just giving credit where credit is due, that poll was a uh, product of two different firms, Aspect Strategic that you mentioned. Yes. Also another local firm called Newbridge Strategy, so okay. just wanted to Thank you. Uh, throw that out there. There is no doubt, and no one's going to argue that this is anything less than a full-blown crisis with respect to housing and housing affordability. The question and the debate is whether that crisis is such that we ought to sort of throw out, throw to the wolves, if you will, um, a century-old tradition in this state of local control. That's an active debate. Um, and Laura makes a strong case that, yes, the crisis is of a magnitude that local control be damned. My fear is that some of these bills that Laura listed are going to become another midnight special, as they were a year ago, and only dealt with in the very closing days and closing hours of the session. Let's have that debate now now as opposed to the 11th hour. Final point, uh, yes, there are local answers and local initiatives to address this, but a huge contributor to this housing crisis that is not being discussed is just the cost of interest. Yes, that is Washington-based and somewhat internationally based, but maybe a lot of the advocates could address some of their efforts in that regard as well. You know, people often ask me, what is the number one issue, the number one news issue in Colorado and in the Denver area, and that's affordability. And, and I would say nationwide, too. Um, Alton Dillard was on the other week, a couple weeks back, and he was talking about the, the number one issue is it's the economy, stupid, he, citing um, uh, James Carville. But we've just now seen the legislature and uh, pass a budget that's more than $40 billion and has increased by 5.75%. Representative Lisa Frizzell made a great point. Why is, why is the state spending more money when Coloradans are having to tighten their belt every day figuring out how to make ends meet? So at some point, um, I think we are going to see economic conditions continue to move towards a recession. I don't know if that means we are going to be in a recession or not, but it doesn't look good right now, and we have to address affordability. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's go down the line of our panel, ask them for their highs and lows of this week. Let's start with the low point, Patty. John Eastman, the unindicted co-conspirator in the January 6th insurrection, California has recommended that he be disbarred. We remember he was a CU professor for a while. And in contrast, Carl Rove, Carl Rove another Coloradan, also conservative, said, hey, Trump is wrong to call these people the insurrectionists hostages. So good for Carl Rove, very bad for John Eastman. 
Shocking that there's any doubt about that and shocking that we're still talking about it. Let me go to the other side of the aisle. Democrats, uh, you know, don't always behave well either. Uh, we talked a couple years ago about Democratic money intruding in a lot of Republican elections to elect the more conservative, the more Trumpy Republican candidate, uh, and what that means for our democracy. We just saw that in the Ohio primary a week ago or a week and a half ago, where north of $2 million of Democratic money went in to help boost the Republican Senate candidate, Bernie Moreno, who is now uh, the nominee to, to run in November. Ohio is an increasingly trending red state. Moreno may well win that seat. It's probably a flip of a coin. And Democrats have boosted the Trumpy election denier once again over the more responsible mm -hmm. centrist Republican candidate. Shameful. Chris. Well, I often coach people about how to speak when they're in front of the media or how to engage with the media. I don't always take my own advice, but um, unfortunately, city staff, as Eric mentioned, talked about not considering someone dying um, in a homeless shelter as a negative effect or having a negative impact. I realize that perhaps the person that said that didn't phrase it quite the way they wanted to. It, it came off very technical. Um, but at the same time, we have to remember that these are people, and um, when someone dies, it's a negative impact. Laura. Well, I'm going to talk about the sad state of the Rockies um, at the start of the baseball season. Uh, but, you know, worse than that, I think it's demoralizing to our fellow Coloradans, right? It is, leader if leadership doesn't care, then nobody cares. And uh, it trickles down into our economy for the health of small businesses. Um, and it just presents poorly. Like, we should be on a national stage. And, and when we are on a national stage, we ha want to have a positive attitude and, or, or a positive, you know, feel. And this is certainly not that. Um, it does not represent my Colorado. And I'm sad about that. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised Eric didn't bring that up. All right, let's do something <laughs> positive, Patty, shall we? Oh, yes. I'm going to do 578, I think, positive things in our 40th anniversary issue of The Best of Denver on the streets and on the web right now. 40th anniversary. Yes, that's you a lot of over those. That's a lot of superlatives. <laughs> <laughs> Eric. Way to go, Patty. Way to go, uh, Westward. Uh, thank you to Laura for bringing up the Rockies, and you could actually probably add the Broncos to that list. Talk about a miserable offseason and a miserable season uh, in store here. But there is one sport, and I'm not even a basketball guy. It's not at the top of my list of, uh, of what I watch. And to watch the women's NCAA tournament right now, yes, it's Iowa, and it's Caitlin Clark, and she is a phenom. But it's more than Iowa, and it's more than Caitlin Clark, and it is a pure joy to watch this tournament. Hooray, and looking forward to this weekend. I'm not kidding. I just got the chills when you were talking about that. I totally agree. Chris? Well, I'm looking forward to the solar eclipse on Monday, April 8th. Um, Colorado will see anywhere between 55 and 78 percent of total, um, you know, the total eclipse. Denver is about 65 um, don't look directly at it. Nope. Please don't do that. Get your little glasses. Or what you can do is what I do, is poke a hole in a piece of paper and hold it up, and then you get to see the little crescent, you know, the moon moving across the sun, yeah. projected onto your sidewalk. Um, the last total eclipse was in 2017. The next one in the U.S. won't be until August 23, 2044. That's a long time. That's 20 years from now. There will be a, another total eclipse, of course, next. Uh, there are about two a year. But you'll have to be, like, way, 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 way south of the United States, out in the ocean, to, or in the tip of uh, South America, to see the total eclipse. And that's October 2nd, 2024. All right. Start a trip. Yeah. I love total eclipses. It's a great time to celebrate the wonder of where we live, not only in Colorado, on the planet, in the universe. It's always fun to watch celestial events. Have fun on Monday. Thank you. All right, Laura. Well, I'm going to stick with sports uh, and just say hand in, hands down, college women's basketball has just been tremendous. And the women who have shown up across the tournament have been amazing. 
Um, and I want to uh, also a special shout out to our CU women's basketball team who made it to the Sweet 16 uh, as a buff. Uh, and I would just say, as and you know, when I was an athletic teenager, I couldn't see the opportunity to be a college athlete or let alone a professional athlete as a woman. And these women are not only demonstrating it, they are killing it. So I, I am so grateful that we have made advances for, for women in sports. My high is also about basketball and the election of Colorado basketball legend Chauncey Billups into the 2024 class of the Naismith Hall of Fame. Chauncey played at George Washington High School and at CU. In fact, he will become the first CU buff in the Hall of Fame. Chauncey also played 17 seasons in the NBA in, uh, also with the Nuggets, and now he's a coach in Portland. But beyond all that, Chauncey is a great guy who purposely gives back to Denver, especially to inner city kids. The tuition-free Porter Billups Leadership Academy at Regis University has a 99% on-time high school graduation rate. So the king of Park Hill is making his impact on and off the court, and we're so happy that he's getting this Hall of Fame recognition. And with it being opening weekend at Coors Field, I have to say, go Rockies. We have to hope, right, everybody? We have to have hope. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Laura, for coming on first time. We appreciate it. And thank you all for watching at home or listening to our podcast. I am Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week here on PBS 12. PBS 12 believes in the power of original, local programming. Help us bring more shows, like the one you just watched, by donating at pbs12.org slash program support today.